I welcome you to Community Chapel. Uh, we're here to praise the Lord and we're here to worship him and we ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Isaiah 9, 5, and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. These will be his royal titles. Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His ever-explaining peaceful government will never end. He will rule with perfect fairness and justice from the throne of his father David. He will bring true justice and peace to all the nations of the world. This is going to happen because the Lord of Heaven's armies has dedicated himself to do it. So sorry. <laughs> Let's, if you're able, let's stand together and let's just join our hearts together in worship as we think about the coming of the King.
worship Christ the newborn King. Come and worship, come and worship, worship Christ the newborn
suffered by our side. From the cradle to the cross, rising up victorious, the Messiah Jesus, born to us on that holy Father, you love the world so much that you gave us your only son. You died in our place. Lord, you've done it all. As the song says, what can we do to praise you? But Lord, we want to do something. It's our nature. When people do things for us, we feel like we should do something back. So we give our lives to you. That's all we can do. And I know it's small in comparison to what you've done for us, but we do it, Lord. We are here this morning to worship you, to praise you, and to give our lives to you. We thank you. We remember this Advent season, why it is we are gathered. We are gathered because you sent your son to die for us so that we may have a right relationship with you. Thank you. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Let us praise the Lord with our joyful and thankful giving. Uh, you can put your offering in the plate or you can go to communitychapel.org slash giving to see the many ways that you can contribute.
Father, all things come from you, and we give back to you a token of what you've given us, Lord. We praise you and we glorify you, Lord, and we thank you for the shed blood of your son, Jesus Christ. In your son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, and I almost forgot. Thank you, Jen. John uh, asked, pondered some question. Okay. Okay. That last song we sang in worship had some questions and are worth pondering. And so we're going to spend some time thinking about that as we come to the Lord in prayer. So will you join me as we bow together? What can I do but thank you, God? What can I do but give my life to you? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What can I do but praise you? Every day, make everything I do a hallelujah, a hallelujah, a hallelujah. In 2 Corinthians 8 9, we read, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Heavenly Father, help us to live lives that reflect our profound appreciation for your incredible grace and mercy. Lives expressed to us in your son, that you expressed to us in your son, Jesus Christ. Lives that testify to your goodness and kindness. Lives that actively praise you, not just in words, but actions. Lives that authentically show our faith in you, Israel, and life transforming. Lives that show our lost world how valuable, how wonderful you are. So we ask again, what do do to praise you? Father, this morning we know of a number of our friends in our church who are struggling right now with illness, um, and we want to remember them in prayer. Dave Sitterly, who's very sick right now with the flu, we pray your ministry to him. Alan Johnson, who is also sick today, and Alan Keeler, who apparently is very ill as well. We pray for your ministry to each of these guys and for others in our congregation who are going through this season, the cold and flu season. And, uh, I just think it's interesting that the very season we want to all be together to celebrate you is cold and flu season. And, but we pray for each one of them. And Father, I pray for, for John Maley's sister and ask that you would bring healing to her mortal body and raise her up. I know she's going through a difficult time, but she has confidence in you that you are going to heal her. And I pray that that would be the case, that you would bless her with a healing. I pray for John Britton's brother-in-law, Tony, that you would not only bring healing to him, but more importantly, salvation, that his heart would be drawn to you, seized by the power of your great affection. And Father, we pray for Al Pizzlerusa, who has heart surgery tomorrow, that that would go well, that your hand would be upon him, he would have a good recovery. Thank you that Wayne is with us today. We pray for your touch on his body, that he would recover from the, the back surgery that he went through. And Father, this morning, our hearts are drawn to the to the news about Carol and Gerwin's brother, Dave. God, we're just so sorry that this man got injured and lost three fingers in an accident, and we pray for your ministry as two of them have been uh, reattached, but we pray that there would be healing for him. 
healing both physically and spiritually, that his heart would be drawn to you. And God, that you would just be at work in this story in a powerful way, in ways that are surprising to us and redemptive. And we thank you. And now we pray your blessing on us as we open your word together, as we dig into the teaching of your word. And we pray, Father, for you to um, just guide our thoughts. And we pray also for Beth and the Children and Kids Club that things would go well there for them as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids Club. Thank you, Samuel. Somebody was remembering things. At the end of my prayer, my mind started to wander, and I said, I don't have my gizmo. But Samuel was on top of it, so thank you, Samuel, for being on top of that. I want us to start this morning uh, by reading uh, a, a, a creed, the Apostles' Creed. So will you join me as we read the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into Hades. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This, year, this uh, week, as I was looking at that creed, I noticed something interesting. I've noticed it before, but because we were doing it today, I sped, uh, paid special attention. Jesus' life goes from conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, to suffered under Pontius Pilate. We missed a whole lot of Jesus' life. Have you, have you heard when, you, sometimes when you do a funeral, there's a poem that goes with funerals, it's called The Dash. And so, so everybody has the year of your birth and then eventually the year of your death. And there's a dash between those two years. It's just a dash. And so your entire life is a dash. <laughs> and Jesus' life was just an, a line there in the, the Apostles' Creed. And I, that's, that has nothing to do with what I'm going to share this morning. Uh, it was just kind of an aside that I found curious. So this year, our theme for Advent is a whisper and a roar. And uh, Jesus' first Advent was a whisper, as we've seen, a baby born in absolute obscurity. But his second Advent will be a roar. It'll be obvious. Uh, week one, we looked at, we contrasted the idea of his, of the privacy and, and the uh, private nature of his first advent, the public nature of his second advent. Last week, we looked at the, the idea that his first advent was, a, was in weakness, but his second advent will be in strength. And today, we're going to contrast the idea of the cross and the crown. For Jesus, the first advent meant the cross. For him, the second advent meant the crown, and I want us to unpack what that means. Hopefully, it'll make some sense to you this morning. Jesus' first advent meant the cross, and from a human point of view, a human estimation, we look at what happened to Jesus and think he was the victim of incredible injustice. From a human perspective, that's what we say. This innocent man was killed, but it was part of the Father's will. It was part of the Father's will. The, the mission was the cross. Interesting that when the angels delivered the news to Mary about the fact that she was going to be the mother of the Son of God, uh, here's what the angel said. He said, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. Do you notice what the angel did? He skipped right to the second part. He doesn't say anything about, oh, by the way, your son's going to suffer and die. Doesn't say anything about that. It goes straight to the fact that your son is going to be king. He's going to reign. But when the angel spoke to Joseph, he kind of gave a little more hint about that. And when he said of Mary, he said, she will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save 
his people from their sin. Now that's a word, save, that's a word to unpack because that meant the cross. Joseph may not have understood that. In fact, I venture to guess that he may not have understood that at all. But when they heard Simeon's words in Luke chapter 2, remember they took the baby into the temple. We talked about that last week. And Simeon was waiting there and he just unpacked this beautiful prophecy about Jesus being the savior of the world and basically said, well, now that I've seen the salvation of our God, I can die a happy man. But then he said these words to Mary. He said, and a sword will pierce your soul too. That had to leave that young mom swirling, right? What what is he talking about? A sword's going to pierce my soul too. Hints, hints along the way. So did Joseph and Mary know the ultimate destiny of Jesus? It doesn't seem like the angel gave them that information. Did they know that ultimately Jesus would die for the sin of the world? We have that great song that we sing or hear sung. I don't, I've never sung it that I know of. Mary, did you know? And it asks all these questions along the way that, Mary, did you know that this would happen and that Jesus would do this and that Jesus would do that? Never in that song does it say, Mary, did you know that your son's gonna die a humiliating, excruciating death on the cross? You know why? Because that's not a good Christmas song. It's not a good Christmas song. But I think that we cannot disconnect Christmas from the passion of Jesus. We cannot disconnect what happened in Christmas to what happened on Good Friday and what happened on Easter Sunday. We can't disconnect those two. Those two are inexorably linked. And I'd like us to look at some readings, and I'm going to ask you to join me, some familiar readings that kind of talk about Jesus' mission. We'll talk, start with the most familiar. Will you join me as we read? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For even a son of man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And then as we look in, uh, in the book of Isaiah 53, the, the, the servant song, Isaiah 53 tells us that it was the Father's will to cause him to suffer. That's that's some tough reality to wrap our brain around, but that was necessary. The cross was necessary. Jesus was both the victim of profound human injustice and the recipient of God's perfect justice at the same time. He was the recipient of an incredibly uh, imperfect, unjust system, but he was also the recipient of God's perfect justice. Think about it this way. Jesus came to earth and he took the very worst that human beings could serve up. He was humiliated, he was tortured, he was crucified. The very worst that the human race could offer, Jesus took it. Jesus took it. And he experienced those implications of our sin while he was dying for our sin. And he did it in obedience to to God the Father to satisfy his perfect justice. Some of you may have been watching, like Beth and I have been watching The Chosen. Uh, I I enjoy it, and granted, um, there's a lot of conjecture, a a lot of speculation, a lot of places that he fills in gaps that the Gospels do not fill in, and you just roll with it. You allow for poetic license because the main part of the message is very clear. On one episode, Jesus and his followers are coming into Jerusalem. And there's a scene, and I believe it's on his left. He looks off to his left, and he sees three crosses on the side of the road. Because in the Roman Empire, there were always crosses on the side of the road. They were always killing somebody for something or other. But you can see in Jesus' eyes in that moment, this moment of foreshadowing, of understanding 
that's what's happening or going to happen to me. And it's powerful. It's a very brief moment, but it just captures something very intense. Oswald Chambers said this. He said, the cross did not happen to Jesus. He came on purpose for it. He is the lamb slain for, from the foundations of the world. The whole meaning of the incarnation is the cross. That's a powerful statement. Now, I read an article in Christianity Today recently where the author was kind of asking that same question and asked, is there more to the incarnation than just the atoning work of Jesus Christ? And he says these words. He said, atonement is related to sin and forgiveness, but incarnation is related to divinity and humanity coming into contact in the person of Christ. By becoming incarnate, the Son made himself personally, personally present to humanity in an unprecedentedly intimate way. Unprecedentedly intimate way. His name, Emmanuel, God with us. This author goes on to say these words. He said, if the Son of God became truly, fully human, then God had in, has invested and reinvested in the human project. He affirmed and reaffirmed humanity as good in spite of sin and alienation. Now, let's think about that. When God created us, he created humanity. He created us in the image of God. That's a good starting point. Created us male and female, breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. We became living beings. And it was good until Adam and Eve decided to say, hey, we don't think it's that good. It could be better, Genesis 3. And when that happened, of course, that was the fall of humanity. But in the incarnation, God again said, you know what? I'm not giving up on them. I'm going to invest in them. And here's how I'm going to show it. I'm sending my son as a human being. And that's an incredible statement of God's value on us and makes his grace even more uh, amazing that he saw and experienced the worst that humans could do and loved us anyway. So Jesus' first advent meant the cross because that was the only way that God could reclaim us as his creatures. Jesus' second advent will be uh, will mean the crown. He will be a victor. And there's a lot that we can say about that, but I've chosen to focus on two things. The kingdom of God will revolutionize our lives and is in the process of revolutionizing our, revolutionizing our lives, and we'll look at that in a minute. But I've identified two basic areas. One is justice, and the other is peace. First of all, justice. The kingdom of, of God, the kingdom of Christ, will be a kingdom of justice. We heard these words earlier. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on forever. It will be a kingdom of justice and righteousness. My daughter once said to me, and she said, Dad, maybe you should have been a lawyer. And, and maybe. But, oh, no, there's the call of God on my life to be a pastor. And I wouldn't be happy doing anything but that. But the reason she said that was because I love legal dramas. I, I've read probably every John Grisham book ever known. Uh, I, I like to watch legal or uh, TVs and movies of a legal nature. Uh, just recently, I, I discovered, I never knew about this show before, a show called The Practice. Um, and uh, it's an older show, I think late, ni late 90s, early aughts maybe. But... Um, it's about a criminal defense practice in Boston, and they defend awful criminals who have committed heinous crimes. That's their job. And they acknowledge that their MO is to seek to manipulate the legal system to get their guilty clients off. That's what they do. Now, what I've noticed as I've watched those shows is I find myself in a tension. I like the characters on the show. You know, when you watch a show long enough, the characters kind of become your friends. And I find myself cheering for them. And I say, wait a minute. I'm cheering that they get an act, actual murderer off. So I'm, I have to cheer against my friends. I really do. Because they, they're just doing awful things. Hardly perfect justice, is it? We don't know what perfect justice is in our world. We live in a world of plea bargains. A world where people get off. People make excuses and all these kind of things, 
But God's justice is perfect. Here's what it says in Hebrews 4.13. Nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So we might be able to hide our, our bad conduct from other people. Those of us who are married might even be able to hide it from our spouses. But there's one person we can't hide our true reality and who we really are and our motives and our actions, and that's our Heavenly Father. And we will give an account to him. You can't hide from perfect justice, which is why Jesus died for us. One author said it this way, on the cross, Jesus died in solitary, in solidarity excuse me, with the sinner and suffer. He bore the weight of God's judgment. And he goes on to ask the question, what does, how does Jesus respond to injustice and evil? How does Jesus respond to injustice and evil? The answer is, he bled. That's how he responded to injustice and evil. But in the new kingdom, justice will be, injustice will be replaced with justice because it will not be dependent on us and our legal system. It will be dependent on God. And so how we behave in our personal lives, our personal conduct, how we treat other people, justice will be perfectly reflected in righteousness. The second kingdom is the kingdom of peace. The kingdom of peace. Peace is sort of an elusive thing for us, isn't it? But Jesus is the Prince of Peace. In our world, we're accustomed to war. Just think for a minute about the years that you've been alive and how many wars, not just the United States wars, but wars throughout the world. Think of the number of wars that have happened in your lifetime. Uh, a journalist by the name of Chris Hedges a number of years ago uh, did a study to find out if there had ever been periods of sustained peace in the history of the world. And this was fascinating when I read it. He, it said that he reviewed 3,400 years of human history, 3,400 years of human history, and he found that in those 3,400 years of human history, there were 268 years that were relatively pe war free, more peaceful years. 3,400, 268. If you want the statistic, 92% of the time of human history, there's a war going on somewhere. 92% of human history, there's a war going on somewhere. That's an astounding statistic to me. I just think, wow, we really can't figure this out, can we? And you can see that in the Old Testament, of course, too, as you read through the accounts of Saul and David and the other kings who are constantly warfare. They're constantly battling their enemies. So we are acclimated to war and conflict so far that it's, it's hard to even acknowledge a time when there was peace. Many of us grew up during the Cold War. That wasn't an active war. It was cold, but it felt pretty intense because we felt we lived with this fear that at any moment, <laughs> at any moment, something very bad could happen. Last week was uh, the 81st anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It's getting to the point where there are less and less survivors of that alive. They've just become old men and aged out. But there were still a few that gathered at the USS Arizona, where in that attack, 2,400 U.S. military people were killed. Half of them on board the USS Arizona, which has that monument erected over it that you can still see to this day. Our Navy vessels were sitting ducks in that harbor, and the Japanese attacked them and, and destroyed much of our Navy, which led to us having to respond to that attack and to the declaration of war, and we had to rebuild the Navy. And there are some historians, I'd say more than a few, and economists who agree that it was the wartime economy of World War II that actually brought the United States out of, uh, out of, um, out of the uh, Great Depression. Think about our own state. How much of our state, how, much, how many, what percentage of the people who work in our state, their income is dependent on the U.S. defense industry? The answer is a lot. <laughs> it's almost like we need war or the threat of war to survive economically. 
Now, that's just me talking. That's not the word of God. So you feel free to punch me in the nose after service if, if you think I'm wrong, or at least say, you're wrong, Pastor Jim. That would be fine. But God's kingdom will be a kingdom of peace, a kingdom of peace. Here's what it says. He says it will, he will judge between nations and settle disputes for many peoples. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nations, nor will they train for war anymore. I love that picture there of weapons that were used for warfare being redeemed or, to use modern parlance, repurposed, repurposed for good. Carolyn Aaron says this. She says, human ingenuity is redeemed and redirected from destructive ends to creative ends. But for now, peace does remain elusive. During the Roman Empire, they had something called Pax Romana. Pax Romana meant that a, a citizen could live in tranquility. A citizen of Rome could live in tranquility in the Roman Empire. Do you remember when Paul was on trial and oftentimes he spoke about his Roman citizenship and that was like a trump card. That was a trump card that he used because that was really looked highly upon. That was viewed highly if you were a citizen of Rome. So Roman citizens had a certain guarantee of safety and security. But here's the news. When you have a military state in place, it's probably a lot easier to secure safety and security for your citizens. The philosopher by the name of Epictetus said of Pax Romana, he said, while the uh, emperor may give peace from war on land and sea, he is unable to give peace from passion, grief, and envy. He cannot give peace of heart for which man yearns more than even for outward peace. I paused for a moment this week and looked up the history of Epictetus, and I thought, I wonder if he ever crossed paths with the Apostle Paul. I wonder if Epictetus and the Apostle Paul ever went to Starbucks and had coffee and just talked for a minute, because they have a lot in common. Apostle Paul says this in Romans 5.1. He says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith in Christ, we have peace with God. We have peace with God because we've been justified by, uh, by faith in Christ. So peace begins not out here, which is where we're all focused on. Peace begins in here. Peace begins in here as we allow God to redirect our hearts away from selfish, vengeful attitudes toward kindness. The biblical idea of peace, shalom, is, is not just the absence of war, but the presence of well-being. Even the presence of prosperity, some have speculated. One author says it's God bringing order out of chaos. And so Jesus' second advent will be the, uh, the kingdom of righteousness, justice, and peace. The final thing I want us to think about today is how can we live into the first advent while we anticipate the second advent? Titus chapter 2, verses 11 through 14 helps us answer that question. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of, our, and of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem from all the wickedness and to purify for, for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. So we live into our identity as children of God in this life that Jesus provided for us through his death and resurrection while anticipating the eternal nature of his reign, that he will reign eternally. Christ's reign starts in us individually as we crown him king and lord of our lives. It's easy to look out there and say, oh, look at all that that's happening and how wrong that is. I gotta look in here. We gotta look in the mirror. We gotta watch those four fingers that are pointed back at us, or three fingers, rather, that are pointed back at us and say, wait a minute. Am I surrendered to Christ? Am I surrendered to his lordship and, and to be my king? And am I, have I declared my allegiance to him? Am I cooperating with the Holy Spirit in my daily life as he seeks to conform me to the image of Jesus Christ? We start with the in here as we anticipate the out there. This week we were de decorating our Christmas tree. 
I think Beth was a little bit surprised when she came home and saw that I actually put up a Christmas tree because I, I do tend to have a little bit of a bah humbug streak in me. But I said, eh, this will make my wife happy. And it actually made me happy too. We put on music and got the ornaments out. And while we were put, getting the ornaments out, we have some that my mom gave us. And so seeing those old ornaments from my mom kind of triggered some reminiscing and thinking about the good old days back home when I was a kid and how, that, how great that was, you know, decorating the tree and, um, and uh, putting the lights up and cookies and music. In our family, we went from the spectrum of Mitch Miller to Handel's Messiah as my dad loaded the records on the phonograph. We were an eclectic group, and it still am. I love them both. I love Mitch Miller, and I love Handel's Messiah, and uh, have both CDs available at the ready. But we had to wait until Christmas morning to open our gifts. My parents were very strict about that. They, however, did not encourage the Santa Claus myth so once my mom had wrapped the presents, she put them under the tree. <laughs> and they just started, the pile grew and grew as more presents started coming under the tree. And all we could do was stare longingly at the bacchanalia under the Christmas tree. We couldn't do, I mean, occasionally maybe a shake. But other than that, couldn't do anything. You see, we lived with a sense of the already and the not yet. Yes, it was the Christmas season. The tree was lit up, it was beautiful, it smelled good, and the cookies were delicious, and the music was playing. It's the Christmas season, that's exciting. Not Christmas Day yet, so you better not touch those presents. That's how we live in this life. We live in a sense of the already and not yet as Christ followers. We live with our new identity and the assurance of Christ's presence with us, but we wait for the day when Christ will reign over the earth and we look forward to his kingdom of justice and peace. So Jesus' first advent meant the cross. His second advent will mean the crown. And we live in anticipation of the already and not yet. I know I've given you a lot of scripture to chew on today. But I have a, a little bit more. So because I read in Hebrews chapter 9. These two verses uh, that bring the advent theme really together. Just as people are destined to die once. And after that to face judgment. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sin of many. And he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin. But to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Almighty God we thank you for your word. We thank you for the promise. We thank you for what has already been provided for us at the cross of Jesus Christ. You came Lord Jesus for the cross. To give your life away to give us a right relationship with God and how blessed we are, how great is the love that the Father has poured out on us that we should be called children of God. You didn't give up on us despite our rebellion. You love us passionately. You love us tenaciously. You love us relentlessly. And we thank you for that. And we look forward to the, cr the crown. We look forward to the day when you will reign forever and all all the woes and all the ills and evils in our world that we as followers of Jesus Christ sometimes wring our hands about, those will all be done away with because you will reign and every, every knee will bow, bow and every tongue confess that you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. We look forward to that and we thank you for that blessed hope that we have in Jesus' name. Let's stand together as we respond, if you're able.
book of Revelation is a wonderful book of worship. And uh, for our benediction, I wanted us to read a couple verses from Revelation chapter 5, where John had this vision. He said, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne, encircled by four living creatures and the elders. The four living creatures and the elders sang this song. Let's read together. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and glory and glory and praise to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever amen you may be seated just wanted to let you know um, we had a great night on friday night um had a, just a lot of fun. Uh, I want to thank Dottie and everyone who participated. So many people did so many projects and made it a great night. Uh, Jeff was driving the, the wagon around out with the Christmas lights on it and uh, um, around the field out here. And then John had a bonfire out there. Um, we had uh, all kinds of cookies. Oh, so many cookies. I had to cut myself off after a while. And, uh, of course, our special guest, uh, Santa George, who came and uh, we had, I think, what, 20 kids here maybe, and Santa was in his glory. Uh, he just had a great night. So it was fun. We had a good night, and thank you for everyone who worked hard. Uh, as I mentioned in my prayer, Dave Sitterly is very sick today. 102.8 was his temperature last night when he texted us, and so um, there will not be a second hour class today. Uh, the angel tree gifts are due today, so if you forgot, then you're going to have to talk to Pam and make special arrangements to get him here. Uh, so that we can be ready. She has to sort them all according to families and get them good to go for the delivery next Saturday. And if you are available to help with delivery, you can see Pam. Also, if you're willing to bake uh, a loaf of bread for the, how many families? 12. 12 families. So we need 12 loaves of bread. Um, we have any, so? Okay, we have some. So check with Pam, but if you have time to bake a nice loaf of some kind of bread, um, uh, please, uh, please see Pam. It reminds me, one time I, I tried to bake banana bread. And I forgot something. What would it be? Baking powder? <laughs> That's what it was. So they were banana bricks is really what they were. But you know what? It didn't stop me. So, so I'm disqualifying myself from bake, break, baking bread. Ladies, you have a gathering next, uh, next Friday night at... Uh, at what time is it? Next? 6.30? Okay. Um, and if you'd like to attend, there's a sign-up sheet in the back, and we invite you to join us, join them for that. Uh, we will have a Christmas Eve service, one of my favorite times of the year, and uh, we've got, got some plans being made as well as Christmas Day. Yes, I know, Christmas is Sunday this year, and um, but man, what a great way to celebrate the birth of Christ by being together and, and worshiping. Um, we're not going to have fellowship or second hour that day. It'll be brief so you can get back and get your jammies on. Please don't wear your jammies to church. I know we tried that one year and it didn't work too well. Um, so I believe uh, that's everything, except it's our friend Art's birthday. Two in a row we had, two birthdays on Sunday. Oh, we're going to have a piano playing. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Art. Happy birthday to you. Sing the uh, Oscar, the Grouch version of it, but uh, I'll give you that in private. So. All right. God bless everybody. Have a great week.